there are plenty more ways to compress than Huffman encoding. Like, anything you could come up with. There's so many other crazy ideas. Uh, so let's just compare, just to get a feeling of what else is possible, Huffman coding with others. So the big idea in Huffman coding is that we want to represent common symbols with small numbers of bits. Like if the letter E is used all the time, maybe make it a smaller representation than Z. Now there's lots of other approaches. For example, there's something known as run length encoding. And in this approach, you replace each character by itself concatenated with the number of occurrences. So for example, if I have 10 X's, four Y's, and then five X's again, uh, we would write this out as X, 10, Y, four, X, five, or something. Uh, so that's one approach that's totally different than Huffman coding. Another is something known as LZW, and there's a bunch of variants of this approach. And the basic idea is that you search for common repeated patterns in the input. And if you're curious about this, see the extra slides at the very end of this slide deck. Now the general idea that all of these compression algorithms use is that we want to exploit redundancy as well as existing order inside each sequence. Sequences that have no existing redundancy order, uh, I should note, may actually get enlarged. They may not, the, the compression algorithms that you build may make things worse, okay? But where there is order, these compression algorithms should shrink our data down to a smaller bit stream. So in order to compare compression algorithms, we know that uh, run length encoding does one thing, LZW does another, Huffman coding does a third thing. If I want to be able to uh, compare them, well, what you would find if you did experiments is that some algorithms are going to do better or worse on other files, right? You may find that Huffman encoding does really well for Moby Dick, LZW works really well for code. I don't know. I mean, that's not really a realistic example, uh, but I hope the metaphor is helpful. So what I'd like to do is compare them in some nice way. And that's where we're going to come to this idea of information theory, or, or I guess uh, compression theory. So what I need to do is refine our picture that we had in slide three, this model of algorithms operating on bits, uh, to handle a little corner case that'll make things otherwise confusing. Oops, all right, I gotta go forwards. Okay, I clicked, and now I gotta go, yeah. All right, we're pros here though. So I'm gonna make the model that I have a little more complicated than I have bits that go into an algorithm and then get other bits back. And specifically, um, I want to start by talking about a, an important and straightforward puzzle. Okay. Let's suppose we have an algorithm designer who says their algorithm super zip can compress any bitstream at all that you give it by 50%. Why is that impossible? Let's try and think of that. So how do you know that the super zip designer is just plain wrong? So one big problem is that if the super zip designer is correct, well, then you can take any bit stream, compress it, then compress it again, then compress it again and again and again and again until you get just one bit. And that means there, need to be, there needs to be a decompression algorithm that somehow magically knows that this one should be zero, zero, which goes back to one on one and so forth. So this is obviously impossible. Okay. Let's see another issue. So there's another argument, which basically goes like this. There are far fewer short bit streams than long ones. This is actually a pretty deep idea where we're now starting to, to sink into this world of compression theory. So guaranteeing compression even once by 50% is impossible. Nobody can write a zip program that works just once for some bit stream. Okay? Now here's my proof. There are 2 to the 1,000 1,000 bit sequences. That's how many different sequences there are of length 1,000. Right. Well, how about bit streams of less than or equal to length 500? Well, it, it turns out there's, okay, the numbers basically are this. There's one bit sequence that is blank. There's two bit sequences of length one. Length one. There are four bit sequences of length two. There are eight bit sequences of length three and so forth. So if I add all these up, I see that there are only two to the 501 minus one bit streams of length less than or equal to 500. So in other words, if you're trying to compress, you have 2 to the 1,000 possible inputs to your algorithm and only 2 to the 501 minus 1 places to put them, that is destinations. And so if you want to be able to uniquely decompress, you can't make a bijection between these two sets. This is a much larger set than this one. Okay? In fact, if you think about plucking random inputs out of a hat, 
that is I take some arbitrary totally random bit sequence, the chance that it can be compressed by 50% is only going to be roughly 1 and 2 to the 499. Okay? So it's kind of interesting that uh, Moby Dick, that it can actually be compressed so well that we can get 70% compression. Because as we just saw, most bit streams, just by the pigeonhole principle, this notion that this set is much larger than the, than the destination set, it implies that your chances are extremely low of being able to compress at all. So just a thought. Okay, compression, it's pretty cool that it rests on this notion that and and that random data, this seems to suggest, can't be compressed at all. All right. So now here's a sneaky situation that's going to motivate a need for a change in our model. So universal compression is impossible for the reasons we just described, but actually uh, here, we can see that trying to compare different compression algorithms could still be quite difficult. So what this right here, this proof showed us, is that most data is incompressible. Uh, and what this example is showing is that, that, well, maybe it's the case that, I don't know, some special decompression algorithm will be able to take some set of bits and output an arbitrarily gigantic s a stream of data. So what I mean by this is, Let's suppose we write a special purpose compression algorithm that simply hard codes a small bit sequence and returns a large one. So this file, Game of Thrones Season 6 Razor, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this MP4 file, it's really big. It's like, you know, what, one, two, three, it's almost nine gigabytes or gigabits. And this compression algorithm, or sorry, this decompression algorithm, you could in principle write a program, you give it 0, 1, 0, and it gives you back these nine billion bits. So the cheating that we're doing here is that we're not taking into account the actual uh, cost in space of the decompression algorithm itself. So if we were being more honest with ourselves, we should include the bits needed to encode the decompression algorithm itself. That is the Java code or whatever language needed to do this decompression. That's an important point. And for this reason, we're going to need to change our model. So the alternate model is going to be self-extracting bits. So before, our model was we take some data, we put it into a compressor, and get back some other data. Here, instead, we're going to take our, our bit stream and give it directly to a Java or whatever language interpreter and get an output bit stream. And in this way, we're keeping things just a little simpler. We're basically wrapping up the compressed bits and the decompression algorithm all into one file just so we have a more concrete picture of what's going on, okay? Now, if you want a concrete idea to hold on to, what I mean by this, let's imagine that we store the compressed bitstream as a hard-coded variable of type byte, uh, sorry, of, a, of type byte array, and that will result in uh, a Java file, which you can think of as self-extracting, okay? And so ultimately, the algorithm here, okay, plus the data, the compressed bit stream, we're thinking of it as an input to an interpreter, and the interpreter will somehow execute those bits. And then at the very bottom of all of the abstractions we have, there'll be some kind of physical machine that does the work, and that's something you would see in 61C. Okay? So that is going to be our new model for compression. And the motivation was we wanted to avoid this sneakiness uh, where a decompression algorithm could be arbitrarily complicated. So in the next video, we'll reflect just briefly on what this means for us. And we'll see a little example of this that's a little different.